before we start, I just want to Instagram this really quick. Because um, if you don't Instagram it, it's like it didn't even happen. So um, get together a little bit. OK, smile. OK, got it? OK, I'm done. Um, hi. I'm Kristen Howerton. I'm a professor of psychology at Vanguard University here in Costa Mesa, California. Um, and I'm also a blogger. I read a blog, a parenting blog, called Rage Against the Minivan. I would love to tell you that I entered the field of psychology because I had this innate desire to help other people. And while there was a little bit of that, a big part of my motivation is that I've always been really curious about human nature. Why do we do the things we do? Why does there seem to be this big gap between what we say we want to be and what we say we value and how we actually behave? And I want to look at some of those questions today, but before I do that, I want to tell you a little story. So about six years ago, my husband and I had two kids. We had a son we'd adopted from foster care, and we had a daughter who arrived the old-fashioned way. And we decided we wanted to add another child to the family. And so we learned about a little boy named Kembe who lived in an orphanage in Haiti. He needed a family. And so we bundled up mountains and mountains of paperwork, as one does with an adoption, and we sent it over, and then we waited. And a year passed, and two years passed, and three years passed, and there was just a massive adoption backlog for anyone adopting from Haiti. And so three years in, you know, we decided we wanted to be visiting him a lot, and so we would take trips down to Haiti. We would take turns. One of us would go. One of us would stay home with the other kids. Well, during that three-year period, I also had another baby, also the old school way. But I really wanted to go down and, and visit with Kembe because I hadn't during my pregnancy. And so when she was about six months old, I decided to take her down with me because I was still breastfeeding and that was the only way we could go. And I had some family and friends express a little concern about taking such a young child down to a third world politically volatile country. And I was like, you guys, it's fine. What is the worst thing that could happen? Um, <laughs> if you're paying attention to dates, um, the worst thing did happen. So on our second day there, when I was with my baby and Kembe at the orphanage, a massive earthquake hit the city of Port-au-Prince, where we were staying. And um, this picture was actually taken just a couple seconds before the earthquake. And I don't think I need to describe the devastation for you guys. I'm sure you've seen footage. It was, it was a horrific event that affected so many lives. Uh, we were very fortunate to have survived because we were in a more Western-built building. But it was horrific, and it was absolutely the most terrifying thing I've ever experienced in my life. But I think what a lot of people don't understand about that experience for those of us that were there is it didn't end after that first earthquake. There were aftershocks that continued to come that first day almost every hour. And those aftershocks felt almost as big as the first earthquake. And you guys, I'm from Southern California. I've lived here for 20 years. I know earthquakes, right? These aftershocks were bigger than anything I've lived through in Southern California. They were absolutely terrifying. And so I'm there without my husband and two of my children with a little boy who's not yet mine and a small baby. And I am scared out of my mind. Because these aftershocks, every time they come, I think this is going to be the one that flattens the building I'm in. And the building I was in was forming cracks so big that you could see through them like a window. But you couldn't stay outside because of the mosquitoes, and there was threat of looting and robbery. And so we had to be inside. And so for days, I was inside of a building, parked by a door, trying to keep my children close to me, and then running outside every time I felt the earth shake. So I wasn't sleeping much. I, I, was, a, I was a wreck. I was panicked and freaked. And I am, I'm a type A personality, OK? I'm the person who, when I am stressed out, I find something to do. I assess the situation. What can I do? Let me work on it. Let me find a solution. But in this situation, there, there was just no solution to be had. I mean, there was no, nothing I could change. A lot of my friends who were there in Haiti, who, um, who work and live there that I'd gotten to know, they were going out and helping. You know, they were helping to give stitches to people and helping to dig and look for people. But I had two little kids to take care of, so all I could do was sit in that house and wait for the next aftershock and hope that we, you know, and run outside with the children. Um, and I desperately, desperately wanted to go home. But my time to, to go home, the day I was supposed to fly home, came and went. 
The airport was completely shut down. We were hearing rumors it could be months before the airport opened up. And so I was just stuck in Haiti. And it felt like Groundhog's Day, every day waking up and just dealing with the aftershocks and running outside. And so I finally decided the one thing that I can focus on here, the one thing that I can do is I can be ready to go when a plane comes for me. And I'm going to be ready by packing my suitcase really well. Um, and again, it's funny what the mind does in moments of trauma. Okay, and I, I, Even as I talk about this, I know it sounds loony, but I packed that suitcase like it was my job. I unpacked everything. I was experimenting with folding techniques. I was, there might have been charts involved, I don't know. Um, I, I was just packing and unpacking and strategizing. And this, you know, in this moment of just terror for me, this gave my brain something to do. It was a distraction. If I can think about this suitcase, I don't have to keep thinking about what happens if I don't survive and my husband and two kids at home never see me again. We talk about being scared to death. We say that really flippantly. And this is the first time that that actually applied. I was scared to death. I thought I was going to die. And this gave me just something to focus on, OK? So finally, after days of you know, this kind of existence, uh, we hear that the embassy, the American embassy, is offering flights out of um, the embassy. Big military jets are coming in with supplies. And they decide once they empty those out, they can put Americans on and send us home. So we make our way to the embassy. We get there. It's full of Americans, just like me, desperate to go home. We've all, you know, I mean, it's just people walking around, shell-shocked. And we hear the planes coming, and there's a line formed. And I'm at the front of the line, and I, it looks like I'm going to be able to get on this next plane to go home. And I'm thrilled. I'm overjoyed. And I'm standing there in line, white-knuckling my special coping mechanism suitcase and holding my daughter in the other hand. And I'm, I'm so, I, you know, it's just like, my moment is here. It's, it's coming. I'm going to get to go home. I've been waiting and waiting and praying for this. And um, suddenly they make an announcement over a megaphone. And this is what I hear them say. This is not a passenger airline to remind you, so we don't have room for luggage. If you have a bag, it will need to sit on your lap. However, if you have an infant with you, you will need to leave your bag here, your baby or your bag. And it was like a record scratch in my mind, like total elation and joy, and then just like your baby or your bag cannot compute. Um, and you guys, I looked at my baby. <laughs> and I looked at my special coping mechanism suitcase. And you're laughing, but I, this, I hadn't slept in weeks. I hadn't showered. I, you know. The, my state of mind at this point was not sound. And no, I did not actually think about abandoning my baby in favor of the suitcase. But I really, I did do something equally irrational, which is that I got out of line. And I took my suitcase and my baby, and I went and sat on the ground. I sat on my suitcase. And I said, I'll wait. I'll just wait. I'll wait for, for the plane that comes that can take suitcases and babies. There was no plane. <laughs> coming for suitcases and babies, but I just, I will wait. And I sat down, and I, you know, um, had a little come to Jesus moment with myself. And about 10 minutes later, I realized that I was being crazy, and that the thing I wanted, the thing I really wanted, was that airplane, and was to get back with my family, and was to be in a country that the ground wasn't shaking, that I wasn't scared out of my mind. And so I grabbed my baby, and I said a tearful goodbye to my special suitcase. And I ran for that bus that was headed to the tarmac and begged to be put back in line. And I was by reason of insanity um, and possibly fear of, uh, of me um, in that moment. Anyway, all that to say, um, we were evacuated. This is my daughter and I on that jet, um, on that military jet. Thankfully, we got home. We were, we were reunited with my husband and um, my other kids. And a week later, um, my son Kembe was able to come home. He is now a rather acculturated kindergartner with a love for McDonald's and that Gangnam Style song. So <laughs> thanks, America. <laughs> um, anyway, getting back to these questions of human nature, which I think relate a little bit to, to what I was going through. Um, one of the things I've noticed, you know, I've worked in a lot of different um, 
types of settings as a psychotherapist. I've worked everywhere from a group home to a drug rehab to a private practice where I saw a lot of pretty high-functioning clients. And obviously, these people had different details, different stakes. Um, you know, some stories are more dramatic than others. But I noticed these parallels with all of the clients that I saw. Um, I noticed a pattern, and that is that people, when they were in pain, when they felt fear, anxiety, depression, shame, trauma, whatever pain they were feeling, I noticed that what they would do is they would find some activity to numb out from that pain, some kind of a habit. And that habit could be anything from drugs and alcohol to working too much, what have you, but there was some habit that they would latch on to, which fine, you know, I mean, it's not necessarily bad that we might want to do something like pack a suitcase to, to cope. But then I noticed that the clients would, the habit would become central to their well-being. The habit would become its own problem. It would just take over. And then what would happen is the habit would start to take precedence over their relationships over their goals, over their values, and their priorities are being ignored. And we know that this is true, this, this pattern I'm describing, we know this is true for drug and alcohol addiction. But I don't think we talk about this as much for those of us that are kind of in a middle space, don't identify as an addict, we're not doing something that's inherently harmful, but we found diversions or distractions for ourselves that become central, that become a coping mechanism, that become how we deal with stress. And that's what a diversion really is. It's an activity, it's a recreation that takes our mind off of our concerns. Not bad in and of itself, but sometimes it, it can become this pain-numbing habit that keeps us from reaching our goals or from connecting with other people, and that's where we run into problems. So diversions, healthy versus unhealthy, how we determine whether our distraction or our diversion is a good or bad thing really depends on context. And what we want to look at is, is our diversion um, causing us to value that distraction over our relationships? Okay, are we doing this so much that we're ignoring the people that we love, that we should be in community with us? Is it distracting us from our goals? Okay, are we, are we using this diversion or distraction so much that we're not doing the things that we really say we want to do? And then is it causing us to put our problems on hold? Okay? Now, a diversion, again, in and of itself isn't bad, right? It's not bad to find something that we can do to temporarily, keyword temporarily, take our mind off of our problems. That's actually pretty healthy. The problem is sometimes our diversions aren't so temporary, and we don't give ourselves the space to feel our feelings ever. And I'm going to talk about one of the big diversions that causes us to do that in a second, but I'm, I bet you can guess it. Um, but our diversion comes so, becomes so big, we don't have time to feel our feelings. We don't have time to work through or process our feelings. And when we do that, do our problems get solved when we ignore them? They don't. And in fact, oftentimes they fester and actually get worse. So if, you know, if I can give you one takeaway today, um, it's the following statement. Now, this is going to sound a little trite. It's not poetic. You're probably not going to want to cross-stitch this on a pillow, but here it is. The only way to work through crappy feelings is to walk through crappy feelings. That's it, okay? We can avoid, we can distract, we can divert, and sometimes that's what we need to do, but at the end of the day, we've gotta walk through those crappy feelings. And you know what, we all have them, and it could be depression, it could be anxiety, it could be fear, um, it could be concerns about your marital relationship, it could be tension with your kids, it could be aging parents, it could be stress from a job. Most of us have some feelings that are uncomfortable, that we don't want to feel. And the problem is we've become a society that has perfected the art of not feeling our feelings. And if we are not willing to feel our feelings, we're not going to work through them. And the other issue with not feeling our feelings is that we also don't experience the fullness of life. Because if we're spending our time zoned out and numbed out from our feelings, we're also not experiencing joy and community, and pleasure, and con connectedness. We're just zoned, we're flatlined with our feelings if we're not experiencing them. And one of the things I think that's so dangerous today is that we have what I call the advent of the diversion to end all diversions, and that's the internet. Okay, so the internet is this diversion that is available all the time. 
We can log on anywhere, anytime. And many of us do. A lot of us do. We can get online at home. We can get online at work. We can, you know, there's Wi-Fi in the coffee shop. We've got these, right? We can walk around with it. A recent study said that 75% of us have taken our phones into the bathroom because God forbid we be alone with our feelings, like for a moment, right? Um, we're looking at it when we're at stoplights, okay? It is a problem. We have become accustomed to grabbing and looking, whether it's our laptop, whether it's our phone. Our life is, is covered with screens, um, and it's becoming a problem. Now, don't get me wrong. I love the internet. I am enthusiastic about the internet. I work on the internet. It has provided me with wonderful things. I think that social media is a really powerful thing. Going back to the earthquake in Haiti, Twitter and Facebook became like command central for those recovery efforts. People were posting pictures of loved ones on, online on Twitter and Facebook and then matching up when people were found. People were tweeting coordinates where they'd heard voices in the rubble to say, hey, I'm hearing a voice at this intersection. Can somebody come and dig? There was an orphanage that we know of, and they'd run out of water, and they desperately sent a tweet. We have no water. This is our address. And within an hour, someone came by with water, life-saving water. So social media, you know, it can save lives, but it can also waste lives. And we've got to figure out how to balance that out. We have to figure out how to value the space to work through our feelings so that we're not constantly on a screen. Because our life, the good stuff, it's not in here, right? It's not in here. It's out here. It's community. It's love. It's art. It's nature. It's connection. It's people. It's relationship. It's purpose. It's goals. It's not online. Online is a nice diversion. The internet is a great diversion, but it has to be momentary. We've got to know when to let it go. We've got to know when we're done packing that stupid suitcase, right? Because the airplane, it's waiting. It is here. The airplane is here for all of us. So I don't have all of the answers for how each of you moderate your diversions and make sure that you're feeling balanced in your life, but I'll speak for myself. And we know the first step in any recovery process is what? admitting that we have a problem, okay? So on that note, hi, my name is Kristen, and the internet is my suitcase. And I'm learning how to let it go when I need to. And I'm ready to hop on the plane of life. Thank you.